everyone, it's Mark from Flight Sim School, and today we're going to be covering how to do a flight with the G1000 at a beginner to intermediate level, and we're also going to cover some key concepts that simmers with more experience should appreciate as well. My original G1000 tutorial is one of my oldest but still top performing videos, and it's incredibly out of date because it's from before the avionics updates, and I'll be covering everything that's in that video and then some here from loading up the flight plan, flying it in the airplane, and using the most common features of the G1000 so that you can fly a whole flight from A to B following the magenta line around. We'll be using the default C-172, which I suspect is still one of the most popular default planes, but everything we're going to look at is going to apply to any airplane with G-1000 from the Kodiak, the DA-42, and everything else in between. Our flight for today takes us from Stewart Airport just north of New York City down to Teterboro, and it's going to be just long enough to allow us to explore all of the key features that you're going to want to know. Tools like Navigraph and Little NavMap give you the ability to export your flight plan in a format that FlightSim can then load at the world map. And any flight that you either load or create here is automatically going to appear for you in the G1000 once you load into the plane. Doing it this way works fine when you're in a hurry, but we'll actually take this one step further and we'll look at how to plug it all in ourselves. So we'll get some power running to the avionics and from there we can go over to the multifunction display and bring up the flight plan menu. Our route here is broken up into three parts. We've got our origin, our on-route waypoints, and our destination. And I typically start by plugging in the origin and destination, and then I figure out the middle part last, because it's going to make things a little bit easier if you have some instrument procedures that you need to pick. Operating the menus is all done with the dial that's on the right, which has three ways that you can operate it. The button on the top is what shows and hides the cursor that allows you to move around the menu. The outer knob is for moving from field to field on the menu, and the inner knob is for selecting a value on a given field that you want to edit. So if I turn that inner knob on the origin entry here, it's going to bring up another menu. And if I use the inner knob again, it's going to allow me to change the value for that field. On top of that, for the waypoint entry field, you can always type the waypoint in as well by just pressing the little tiny keyboard icon, which is going to be a huge convenience and time savings. And we'll start by entering our departure airport here, which is KSWF for Stewart International. We'll confirm our choice here by pressing the enter key. And on the screen that's come up now, it's asking us to pick the runway that we're going to be using for departure. But if you aren't picking any departure procedures, then you can just press enter again here without making a selection, and it won't really make a difference to the flight plan. Now we can scroll down to our destination field with a large knob. I'll bring the entry menu up again just by using the inner knob. And this time we're going to enter KTEV for Teterboro for our destination. Once that's plugged in, we'll confirm that with the enter key. And again here, we won't pick our runway because it's not really needed. At this point, we're going to finalize our approach by going into the procedures menu where we have three different options to pick from. Select approach, select arrival and select departure. And normally you'd only pick these for instrument flights, but they can come in useful at times, especially when it comes to your first few landings in flight sim. So we're going to go into the select approach menu. The G1000 comes preloaded with a list of all of the procedures available at the airport. And since it's a nice day out, we're going to pick the visual to runway 19, which is going to give us a little bit of help to get down to the runway without the complexity of an instrument approach. Once we confirm that choice, it's going to ask us to pick a transition for the approach. And for a visual one like this, there's really only two options, vectors or straight. And the difference between the two is that vectors is going to give you a longer extended runway center line, and it might not connect up to the rest of your route. So we're going to pick the straight in option for today because it's going to keep things much simpler. That's all of the setup that we need to do for our approach procedure. So we're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of this page where we've got two different options, load or activate. And when you're in the planning phase, like we are now, you're always going to pick the load option, press enter to confirm it, and that'll update the flight plan with all of the waypoints of the procedures that we picked. The last thing we need to do is enter our on route waypoints of which we have three today. And the process is going to be exactly the same for each of them. 
You move the cursor down to the empty line in the en route section. You bring up the entry menu with the inner knob. You enter your waypoint identifier, and then you just confirm it with the enter key. Using the large and inner dials takes a little bit of time to get used to, but after a while it just becomes muscle memory. And once you've plugged all of your waypoints in, you can walk through all of the route by bringing the cursor back up and slowly scrolling down from the top all the way down to the end of your route. And the view is slowly going to move from one leg to the next so you can visualize the entire route. Where things get more complicated when you're entering the route is when you start adding in instrument procedures and you could end up with some segments that don't connect to each other. And in that situation, you might need to change either the transition or even delete some of the en route waypoints to make it line up a bit better. And you can do that fairly easily by just bringing up the cursor again, highlighting the waypoint you want to delete and pressing the clear button. We're all set for today though, so I'll get the engine running and I'll meet you just short of the runway to check a couple last few details before takeoff. All right, there's just a few things to point out before we get going to make sure that we're all set. First off, we're going to want to make sure that we are in GPS mode, which is always easy to tell because the entire HSI is going to be that magenta color. And if it isn't for whatever reason, you can press the CDI key to switch into it. We're also going to pre-select our cruise altitude of 2,500 feet now so that once we enable the autopilot, it'll automatically level off for us at the right altitude without having to do anything else. To make sure that our altimeter is seeing the right altitude though, we'll have to update our barometer to the right value, which to be honest, I almost always just do by pressing the B key, but you can do it the correct way by using the dial if you prefer. I just find this a little bit faster. The other thing you'll want to do before getting airborne for a mostly visual flight like this one is figure out what your first move is going to be once you're airborne. And the easiest way to figure that out is to actually just scooch over to the multifunction display, get an idea of where you are, where your flight path is, and how you're going to get there. We're taking off from runway 16 here, and our route's being shown by the magenta line that goes from the airport out to the southwest. So that means our first waypoint is going to be somewhere off beyond that. So once we're in the air, we'll need to turn to the right to get going in the right direction. You can also tell precisely what course it is between point A and point B by looking at the desired track field. It's just at the top here and you can see the same information on the PFD if you prefer. There's a desired track field just to the top right of the HSI and the arrow of the HSI itself is automatically going to update to point to the exact same heading and we're actually going to dig into this a fair bit more once we're in the air. All right, so as we're getting airborne, the center needle of the HSI is starting to move off from the middle more towards the right side, which is its way of telling us that we're getting off course. And the more deflected it gets to either side represents how far off track we actually are. That makes sense if we compare it to our route on the MFD. We can clearly see that with the heading we're flying right now, we're getting further and further away from our flight path. So to get going in the right direction, we're going to start by turning to the desired track between the two waypoints. The DTK from the airport where we just took off to the first waypoint is on a course of 225. And once we roll out on that heading, the HSI won't be centered since all we've done at this point is put ourselves on the path that's going to be parallel to our flight path. So we have to turn to a heading that's going to allow us to actually intercept the magenta line. How much you actually turn towards the flight path is going to depend on how off course you actually are, but I'll usually use something between 10 and 30 degrees depending on how far off track I am. We're not that far off course here, so I'm going to start with about a 20 degree turn to the right. And then as we get closer and closer, I'm going to shallow that up until we're right on top of the flight path. The magenta line is now going to start getting closer and closer, and the course deviation indicator at the center of the HSI is also going to start moving back towards the center. And when we're right on top of the magenta line, it'll also be centered where our airplane is in the HSI. 
Before we get into all of that though, one thing to note is that so far I've hand flown the airplane to do all of this, but you could very well have enabled the autopilot earlier on to help you out. When you enable it, it defaults into roll and pitch mode, so it's going to hold the wings at whatever angle they were at when you enabled it, so in our case that's just going to be wings level, and it'll hold the nose up attitude that we had when we turned it on. Once we start to get closer to our cruise altitude though, it's going to start slowly reducing that pitch and it'll level off for us automatically and it'll switch into altitude hold mode to maintain 2,500 feet. To change headings once the autopilot is on, you'll have to switch into heading mode. But before you do that, you should quickly sync it to the current heading that you're flying by pressing the top of the heading button. And then from there, if you want to change your heading, you just have to twist it left or right. Now, as we start coming up on the magenta line, you can also see the CDI is centering itself, like we said. So that means it's going to be time to twist the heading bug so that it's pointing at our desired track of 225 like we saw earlier. And at this point, we're going to be effectively right on course towards our first waypoint. So with everything that we've just learned, we now know how to get airborne and intercept our flight path to get on course. But if you want to make things even easier for yourself, what you can do is enable nav mode once the autopilot's on. What that'll do is follow all of the waypoints of your route for you automatically and it'll just sequence through all of them all the way to your destination. And if you aren't already on course, it'll also intercept your flight path for you so long as you put the plane on a heading that's going to cross the magenta line. If we look over at our flight plan, we can actually see there is a magenta arrow that shows us the active leg that we're currently flying. And as we progress through the flight, that's going to automatically update it itself so that we can easily tell where we are and where we're going at any point. One thing you might want to do though at times is actually skip over a waypoint and go directly to another one on your route. Say for example, if you want to cut out a corner because you just want to take a bit of a shortcut. We can do that pretty easily actually by just bringing up the cursor on the flight plan, scrolling down to the waypoint that we want to go to, which is just going to be the next one in this case, and then we'll press the direct to button while that waypoint is highlighted. That'll bring up a window where we have to confirm our choice and the fastest way to do that is to just press enter twice in a row so it updates our flight plan for us. Doing that's updated the map and we now have a new track that we need to fly and it's also updated itself on the HSI. It's now pointing at the DTK of 140 to go direct to Volu and since the autopilot is in nav mode you can see it's automatically started turning for us to make sure that we stay on that course. That's probably a good segue to start talking about the difference between a heading, a course, a track, a bearing and the desired track which we can see all of them on the PFD and the MFD, so it's important to understand what each of them means because they're all distinct things. Let's start with the easiest of the bunch, which is our heading. That's the direction that we're flying either on the heading indicator or on the compass, and right now that's a heading of 141. Our track, on the other hand, is the direction that we're flying across the ground, which can be the same thing as our heading, or it can be different if there's wind pushing us around. There's very little wind today, but even just a few knots can throw you off course and make you fly a different track across the ground, and that means that you have to crab into the wind to fly the track that you want. The desired track, on the other hand, is the course that's going to bring you directly from point A to point B. So right now, the DTK to Volu is 140, so that means that we need to fly a heading that's going to give us a track of 140 to get where we're going. The last heading that we can see at the top of the PFD is the bearing, which represents where a waypoint is relative to where you are at any given moment. And where this comes in useful is, for example, if you are off track for whatever reason, either after takeoff or if you decided to deviate from your flight plan. To understand that one a little bit better, let's go back to our takeoff for just a second. You can see that while we were traveling towards the magenta line that our bearing to our waypoint is 229. So if we had flown that track across the ground, we could have gone directly to the waypoint right away from where we were, rather than first intercepting the magenta line and then going to the waypoint. In other words, it basically allows us to fly a straight line to whatever waypoint that we're currently going to, even if we're not on the magenta line.
So if you remember, we set up our route before takeoff so that we have a straight in visual approach to runway 19. And we're just going by our last waypoint before we reach it now. And since the autopilot's in nav mode, it's automatically going to align us with the runway without us doing anything else. Of course, to land, we also need to descend at the right time so that we can make it to the runway. And for a small plane like a Cessna, you don't need any fancy tools since you likely didn't go very high in the first place and you could just time your descent visually by looking at the runway. But we'll still look at how to use VNAV anyways just for fun. Right now, our autopilot altitude is set to 2,500 feet, but if we want VNAV to be able to descend for us automatically on the approach, we're going to need to reduce that. So what I'll actually do is set it to 500 feet, because we'll likely disable the autopilot around that altitude anyway, so we can have at least a little bit of fun coming into land. I also armed VNAV just now, so the active vertical mode is still altitude for altitude hold, but it's added in white right next to that, the next mode that it's armed, which is VPAT, which is what it'll switch into the moment we start descending. And you can tell where that point is actually going to be by looking at the multifunction display and finding the top of the scent marker on the map. As you go by the top of the descent point, the plane should start descending and it'll follow its calculated path all the way down to the altitude that we set. And if we look at the primary flight display now, you can see that the active mode is now VPAT to tell us that we're on the VNAV path. If you take nothing else away from this video, just remember that if at any point you don't understand what the plane is doing, have a look at the top of the primary flight display to see what modes are active and armed, since it's the best place to get a full picture of what's going on with the plane. The green modes are what's currently active, the white modes are what's armed and is going to engage when the conditions are right to switch to it. And even right above that, you can also see the active leg of the route on top of the distance to that waypoint that you're flying towards. Right up ahead on the MFD, we also see the only two waypoints that you'll get for a visual approach. First, we've got the straight in waypoint, which is where it's going to line us up with the final approach course. And then beyond that, we've got a final approach fix waypoint, which is where you would normally want to be fully configured for landing. At some point during the VNAV descent, there's going to be a diamond that appears next to the altimeter. And although this can look like an ILS approach, it's really just a calculated profile by the airplane. But you can still use that as a guide to stay on the right glide path. You should be trying to keep the diamond centered in the middle of the gauge because that means that you're going to be descending right on profile. And if it's below the middle like it is right now, it means that we're a little bit above the glide path and we should increase our descent rate to catch it. The opposite is true if you end up too low, the diamond will show above the middle of the dial, and in that situation you're going to want to increase your descent rate to make it to the runway. On top of that, if you really want to let the plane handle everything, you could also arm approach mode at this point and the plane will handle doing the descent down to the runway for you, which can be useful if you're flying in really tough wind or weather conditions for the first time. Once you turn the autopilot off, you can also hide the flight director on the PFD because it's just going to get in the way for a visual approach. But if you were flying an instrument approach in low fog, let's say you could leave it on and fly the flight director down to the runway. Really, the core principle here is if you have the flight director up, use it to fly the airplane. Otherwise, turn it off. Turning the flight director off makes it easier to see the flight path vector, which is really useful for a landing because it's going to show you where the plane is actually pointing relative to the heading and the pitch of the airplane. With a strong crosswind, you'd see the flight path vector move off either to the left or the right, and you can use that information as you crab into the wind to figure out what heading that you need to fly to keep it pointing at the runway center line. You can find more information about using the G1000 in my autopilot and ILS tutorials. And finally, if you made it to this point, please make sure to like the video and subscribe to get more similar content.